Welcome to Crash Course, a podcast about political, social, and business disruption and what we can learn from it. I'm Tim O'Brien. Today's Crash Course, Authoritarianism versus Democracy. Today, I'm going to take you to Berlin to join me at the epicenter of one of the most grotesque authoritarian moments in world history, the rise of the Nazi regime and Adolf Hitler and all of the horrors that flowed out of that. To consider that history and the possible threats from authoritarianism in the present, I asked my colleague Andreas Kluth, who writes about politics and national security for Bloomberg Opinion, to be my tour guide around Berlin and to focus on a few key landmarks. Andreas, how are you? I'm good. Thanks, Tim. Andreas is also a German, and I think that that's... And American. And I'm sorry, a German-American, or an American-German. Or as I like to think of it, you're a citizen of the world. That's maybe the better way to do it. A cosmopolitan. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, so I'm going to rely on Andreas to be my tour guide today. And I think we're going to go on a walk now and look at some buildings that might give us a sense of what's happening in other countries right now that I think should concern us all. Great. So where are we right now, Andreas? Right now, we're standing in front of the Reichstag, the building, which is, of course, the home of the Bundestag, the parliament. And there's a fairly elaborate security entrance here, which is surprising to me. I know every building needs some security, but this is, this is quite complex. Yeah, and it's surprising to me that it's surprising to you, because don't they have this at the Capitol? You know, I haven't been to the U.S. Capitol since January 6th. I know that they've had to tighten security because of the siege that took place there. And so that's a good question. I think when I get back to the U.S., I should go take a visit and we can compare notes. Yeah, and this has also, the insecurity has increased in the decade that I've been here because we had a copycat event here pretty recently, a copycat of January 6th, when far-right extremists tried to storm this building, but they failed. So we're now smack in front of of the Reichstag. Why is it useful for us to be standing here today to start the tour you're giving me around Berlin? What's the significance of this building? If we try to understand the reasons why the Weimar Republic failed, and of course history never repeats exactly, but we will definitely start noticing echoes that we hear today in the United States, in different ways in Turkey, Israel, Hungary, Russia, China. Because when the Weimar Republic failed, it was replaced by the Nazi regime. That's correct. In 1933, the Weimar Republic was replaced by the Third Reich of Adolf Hitler, even though he never bothered to scrap the Constitution, the Weimar Constitution. That's how democracies die. They just get ignored. The taboos were broken. He ignored the Constitution, and that's how it could happen if it happens again somewhere else. Well, what does this building mean to Germans and to Berliners? There's long lines here as we stand here today, and it's mid-March. It's not the height of tourist season, and there's a lot of people here coming to look at this building, including us. Why is that? Because I think of the layering of history in this building, because it sort of was a witness to some of the best, then the worst, then the other chapters, including division, the Berlin Wall ran right behind it. And then, of course, reunification and a sort of second attempt at German democracy, which is succeeding so far. So it's a story of all the way down through hell and up again and maybe onwards toward something stable. So let's use this a little bit now to talk about the beginning. I think one of the things we can do as we talk today is compare how authoritarianism and fascism and Nazism took root here, how once very solid and well-regarded German institutions and the rule of law failed and gave rise and traction to a military regime with disastrous results. I think there's some echoes of that, probably more than echoes. I think there's some lessons from that, looking at what we're dealing with now in the United States and in other countries, Brazil, India, Hungary, China, Russia. I think one of the things that's disturbing and poignant about this building is is there was a fire here in 1933. It was alleged that it was started by a communist, and and the Nazis essentially used that tale, it might be mythic, to make a case that they were the only ones who could keep Germans safe. Right. The way that went, we still don't know who laid the fire. We know it was arson. That was in February 90 years ago. And... As you said, the Nazis immediately blamed it on a Dutch communist and then communists in general and used it to get a law passed to crack down on their domestic enemies, as authoritarians like to do. 
you take the occasion to get rid of anyone you don't like. And that was followed a month later, by the way, we're speaking on March 23rd, exactly to the day 90 years ago, by the Enabling Act, as an indirect result of the fire, which gave Hitler dictatorial powers. And in effect, this parliament voted itself out of power 90 years ago today, as we're speaking. And that was, of course, the end. The Republic failed first gradually, then suddenly. And that was the sudden end. And the Nazis, of course, were incredibly dexterous about symbolism, about myth-making, about acquiring force and power through any means necessary. And that moment here at the Reichstag was, in many ways, the opening chapter of the Nazi regime. And one of the things that stark to me about it is I don't think many Germans at the time knew that they were riding the back of a tiger. Hitler promised order. There was things that Hitler did. He incited violence. He had foot soldiers in brown shirts who helped keep order on the streets. But I think the German industrial class and other members, stakeholders in German democracy, thought he could keep order and it might end at that. And of course, it became something quite other than that, didn't it? Exactly. And I think some people might be starting to hear the echoes now, but a lot of people, including the president, Paul von Hindenburg, looked down on him at the beginning, didn't take him seriously. They thought he was a cartoonish character. Or he may- liked to dress up in little outfits and make silly speeches. Yes. Or maybe they took him literally but not seriously. Or to Who does use that a- sound like? I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll say it. I think it sounds to me like Donald Trump. And I think that's one of the reasons we're talking today. But you're right in that the establishment at that time, 32, 33, thought it could manage him, Hitler. And it turned out very quickly that they couldn't because, well, now we're already talking about Hitler, but how did we get to that (laughs) point is what I'm wondering, because by that time it was too late. And of course, as you said, when it's too late, you don't know the day before it's too late that you only have one day left. So this is the first of a few spots we're going to look at together today. We decided to stop here because this is the inflection point. This is when erosion began around legislative democracy here in in Berlin and in, in greater Germany. Right. Obviously, there was a hyperinflation and there were things that were different. But here are some things that were very similar to, let's say, the United States or Brazil today. One was hyperpolarization because of their system that manifested itself in fragmentation, whereas in the UK and the US, you have two major parties that are polarized. But it was polarized because the left, which were at that time the communists, socialists, social democrats who hated each other, were absolute mortal enemies of the right, which were the monarchists, the nationalists, and the Nazis, who started as a small movement. And as in other democracies today, a majority were pragmatic, moderate centrists, but they weren't loud or brutal enough. They wanted to play by the rules and kept saying, can we talk about this nicely? Whereas the extreme ends, if you want to call it the woke and the MAGA crowds were shouting at each other and soon literally beating each other up in the streets of the Weimar Republic. So there was both a rhetorical violence and then a physical violence already in the 1920s on the streets, and it's hard to keep that out of a parliament like this. And authoritarians often exploit the fact that other people follow the rules and they don't. Yes, absolutely. Authoritarians exploit a couple of other things. One is they like conspiracy theories. It confuses us. The conspiracy theories like QAnon today, they're remarkably similar, the tropes and structure to the anti-Semitic and anti-communist, but anti-Semitic main conspiracy theories of the time. Even today, QAnon, one of the persons they most like to hate is George Soros, a Jewish cosmopolitan banker. I mean, you could do a lineage. So that was around. And then with with the useful device in all of this, whether it's happening in the 1920s, the 1930s or the 2000s, is there is an other. It it may be a Mexican immigrant. It may be China. It may be leftists. But whatever it is, there is some other force that's coming to take your freedom away, coming to take your sense of well-being away, and the authoritarian promises that they will keep order in place so, quote-unquote, the other doesn't steal it from you. You need to mobilize your base if you're a populist trying to become an authoritarian dictator, and you need the others, us against them. And you need several others. You need some domestic enemies, and initially you're going to hate them more than anybody else. And you need some foreign ones too. And both 
were available back then as they are today. Because on top of this climate of conspiracy theories where nobody knew anything, Putin today loves, there's a famous book called Nothing is True and Everything is Possible. It's his goal, his KGB mind wants us to think there is no truth. That was true back then as well. Because then, a person named Adolf Hitler, first he coined this term in his book Mein Kampf, which he wrote in prison after his first attempt, failed attempt, to take over in the 20s, 23. He went to prison in 24 and he coined the term the big lie. You may have heard that recently. And in the book, he accused the Jews of lying about World War I, that they really caused it, then tried to blame it on the Kaiser and Hindenburg, and that they lost the war and tried to blame it on a general named Ludendorff. That was what he claimed the big lie was. And then he theorized about it and says, if you tell a lie so big, so colossal, normal people can't imagine that it's possible you're lying. Everyone assumes that's when he got his idea for the big lie. And his version was not that any election was stolen or stopped the steal. His version was, we never lost World War I on the battlefield. Our domestic enemies, the woke left, actually the Jews and the communists, everyone I don't like, they stabbed us in the back. So it became known as the stab in the back myth. That was his big lie. He did invoke theft. He did say that parts of the German Empire were stolen away, that the settlement at Versailles was penurious, that the Germans gave up too much, and that what he could affect and what the Nazi regime could affect is a reclamation of all those things that were stolen, not just the German identity, but German lands, right? The German lands that had been lost in the Versailles Treaty, the German lands that were demilitarized, that he took those first, and above all, the German honor, because he played, and this is populist, populists play to resentments, not ideals. They play to the low, not the noble sentiments in the population. They want to mobilize a mob. So he was humiliated. Germans were humiliated. And he played to that humiliation and resentment. So he had his domestic enemies, whom he blamed for this. And he conveniently had foreign enemies, foreign others, right from the start, too everyone who wrote the Versailles Treaty. So we've been standing here talking about how democracy gave way to fascism in a place where it seemed that democracy was well-rooted. Should we walk a little bit further along and then maybe we can talk about what happened after that occurred? Absolutely. Let's go take a walk. Thanks, Andreas. The, the Hitler Chancellery was all of this. It was gigantic. We're walking on it, in, in it. Albert Speer. And I love the fact that there's a Thai massage parlor there now, <laughs> the, where the entrance was. <laughs> but over So there. this basically was the ground floor of the Chancellery in the 30s. We're actually already over the bunker complex. Okay. So we're back from our break, and I'm still with Andreas in Berlin. Andreas has encouraged me to take a walk with him. Andreas, tell me and our listeners where we're standing right now. We're standing on top of Hitler's bunker where he committed suicide on the same day that the Russians took that building over there, the Reichstag. And Goebbels was with him and his family. They all committed suicide here. This bunker, they could never destroy it. They tried to destroy it, the East Germans. This is just on the eastern side. So it, the remnants of it are below us. For the blocks, all the blocks stretching out in this direction was Hitler's chancellery a bombastic space meant to intimidate people in that neoclassical fascist style. You had to march a mile just to get to his office, which was huge. It meant to invoke the Roman Empire and the Reich, which was envisioned to last as long as the Roman Empire did. Yes, as Mussolini also, they liked to borrow those ancient symbols, the swastika from India as well, and give them a timelessness to, to project forward. But to intimidate the human being, the opposite of liberalism, make you seem small by the time you get to Hitler. So when we started talking, when we were at the Reichstag, we talked about how democracy withers and then comes under assault and then gets co-opted and gives way to something else. Here it gave way to the Nazis. It doesn't do justice to all of the history, but one of the net results of that was a major world war, millions of lives lost, and the Holocaust, the Cold War, and I think some of the lingering divisions that came out of that whole conflict. The bunker itself in a certain way, is a happy ending, or at least it's a reminder that the architect of Nazism was eventually defeated. 
That's right. It, it's a weird ending because remember they tried to destroy it and couldn't. It was so well built that it's just slanted below us, flooded right now. So in a way, it's, it's also it's a reminder that this is below us. It could somehow resurface one day, like a zombie. Like a zombie. The zombie of authoritarianism that doesn't actually go away. You can try to kill it, but if you don't keep an eye on it, it's going to come marching after you once again. Exactly. We're looking at a, a memorial plaque here above the bunker, Andreas. There's a whole chronology here. What's being laid out on this plaque in front of us? The architecture of what's underneath us, of the bunker, of the different rooms that they occupied, he and his lover, Eva Braun, they got married, I believe, just before they committed suicide, and also the other top Nazis that were here with him. So this is the bunker. Here's the wider map. One thing I should say is that this and our next destination right next to us, these are East German buildings, as you can see from the style, that we're looking at the Berlin Wall, which was two walls with a death strip in between in case you needed to shoot someone. And so this is sort of, as you said, one of the consequences of Hitler and the destruction of the Third Reich and all of that was the division of Germany, of Europe, of the whole world, which ran right here, almost on top of his bunker as a result. So as we consider the bunker and Hitler, Andreas, you recently wrote a column that I thought was very powerful about the fact that there's a younger generation of citizens of the world who don't even know who Hitler is. Tell me a little bit about that. I was very uncomfortable when I heard Kanye West talking to Alex Jones and mentioning how basically how much he loved the Nazis and then Hitler was misunderstood. And I realized he has no clue at all. And because what's happened is we've turned Hitler into a meme. You know, there's a film with Bruno Gantz about his last hours in this bunker. In one scene, he loses it. And that scene has become a meme on YouTube. You get the screaming Hitler and you put funny text underneath, you know. Fun about the financial meltdown. In one, I found that I should have bought Dogecoin instead of Bitcoin. And in another one, Hitler can't find a bagel on the Upper West Side. And, you know, so it is inevitable, perhaps, that he would turn over time into parody, comedy, and all these things. But the cost of that is an ignorance like Kanye West's that shouldn't exist. And I think there's a power in comedy and humor to give us a little bit of control over things that are frightening. But the danger in it is if you take things so lightly that you're dismissive of their relevance and you're dismissive of their gravity, they can come back to haunt you, like the zombies we were talking about before. There's sometimes very facile comparisons between Donald Trump and Hitler. They make me uncomfortable at times because I think different regimes have different methods, different autocrats have different styles, and I think overusing Nazi comparisons and overusing Hitlerian comparisons can degrade their power and their relevance. Nonetheless, one of the things that's interesting to me about our walk around Berlin together today and the reason we're doing this show is that there are parallels between the past and the present and also around the issue of consequence. We're standing above the bunker, the consequences of war. We're going to go to another site where one of the other most horrible consequences of the Nazi rise is visible to us today still. Exactly. And actually, I agree with you, and I'm, I'm grateful to you, because you're one of the people who's taken Trump to task the longest, the hardest, and the most bravely, but that you also shy away from these facile comparisons, and I tried to as well. And that's why I actually usually turn to the Weimar Republic, the gradual before the sudden part of the collapse, because if America is at any stage of this, it would be in the late 20s. Certainly not anywhere near something like this, what we're standing on. And when Americans still have agency, Americans still have an ability to use their votes, to use their legislative powers, to rely on the courts, to rely on the institutions like the media and educational institutions, to do the right thing in a fair-minded way, but to be bulwarks against totalitarianism. And with the advantage that they have this as a lesson, whereas in the Weimar Republic they didn't. We are having a day full of lessons and I'm really enjoying it. So where are we going to go to next? We're now going just a few steps to the Holocaust Memorial. It occupies a huge area between the U.S. Embassy and where Hitler's bunker was. And it is essentially, I'll describe it, an undulating sea of concrete slabs meant, I think, quite clearly to evoke a Jewish cemetery. And 
There is a sort of feeling of infinity to the number of slabs that remind you of the, the millions that died and a sort of disturbing asymmetry. The, the paths are angled. You can walk between the slabs, but it's never even ground and you're off balance. And you just realize that something is really fundamentally wrong. It feels wrong. It doesn't feel quite good. The Holocaust Memorial finally opened, I think, on the 60th anniversary of the end of World War II in 2005. It was the result of a lot of different architectural competitions. The final design was Peter Eisenman's and Richard Serra. One thing, by the way, we're observing that I almost always observe when I'm here and that I like is there's a school class because, of course, it's baked into the German education system that children go to Buchenwald, Sachsenhausen, Dachau, the concentration camps, and here and other venues to learn these lessons that we've been talking about. Something else I often observe is when the school classes are here, teenagers, just the wheel of time, when they relax, they're playing catch, they're playing hide and seek, there are lovers sometimes between these slabs kissing. I'm not sure that's not in the interest of the artist because it has become part of the space. It's also a reminder that life goes on. That life goes on. But you can't forget the horrors of the past if you want to live your life in the present with honor and with integrity. And on that note, I remember reading that the slabs are either coated in something or made in such a way that they're essentially graffiti proof or that it's easy to wash that off because of course the big fear was, and that tells you a lot about that the story is not definitively over, there's always a fear that neo-Nazis or others could put swastikas on it, that sort of thing, and deface this whole memory. So the whole ambiguity of the past is there in that way, but in general, I think it's a very special place. And, you know, as we walked up to the memorial, we noted that it's the Holocaust Memorial, but we actually didn't specifically say what it memorializes because you and I know. This is otherwise known as the memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe. But like your column about Hitler, in which you note how important it is that people know who Hitler is in such a colloquial and routine way that you shouldn't have to describe Hitler's acts or Hitler's own personal history. There is a danger that without memorials like this, that we can forget that at least six million Jews in Europe were rounded up and, and murdered by the Nazi regime in concentration camps. And that's another important thing, as familiar as this is to you and me, it may not be familiar to generations to come especially in a time when authoritarianism is on the rise. I'll tell you, on the way here, we also passed the memorial to the Roma and Sinti. Over there behind those trees is a memorial to the homosexuals Hitler killed or the Nazis killed. I'll tell you the type of memorialization that touches me most and that I've written about because of that. It's when you individualize it. That's the other way. Because there is a project, it's called Stumbling Stones in English, where private citizens in Germany and all across Europe can research who lived in their house. And if someone lived in the house who was killed by the Nazis, then an artist, Gunther Demning, comes to visit you and in a ceremony puts a brass plaque in the floor with the names and the date of death of the people, usually the Jews, who lived there. And so all across Berlin, the residential areas, you stumble across these plaques, these tiny little brass plates in the pavement, and you look down, and I've noticed that that works for my children, for instance, they immediately, they take to that. You stumble over it, you look down, you read that, and you read one person's story. And so it's actually, the memorialization is all the time, everywhere, if you open your eyes to it. And literally embedded into the life and the sidewalks and the buildings of Berlin. The digital equivalent of that, there's a wonderful Twitter site that the Auschwitz Museum oversees in their feed on each day. They offer a single biography of a single Jew who was brought to Auschwitz and died there. And they provide as much biographical material as they can about that person, their age, the date of their death. And they're all very poignant. It's accompanied usually by a black and white photograph. That's the digital equivalent, I think, of what we're talking about here at the Holocaust Memorial in a tangible and physical way. Yeah. The other thing that feels important and poignant to me about this memorial is, again, the weaponization of the idea of the other. 
that it can become facile to say that there are people of different political persuasions or ethnicities, different races, different genders, different sexual identities, different faiths, all of whom somehow represent a threat to your own identity, your own sense of yourself, the kind of society you want to live in. That's the tug of war that always occurs inside democracies, I think. The danger is when it stops being a healthy discussion of our differences and teeters into the hands of people who want to stomp out pluralism and tolerance. Absolutely, and it starts with that otherization, us and them, and then the exclusion. I mean, it started with the German Jews being excluded throughout the 30s, long before anyone had the idea of the final solution. Where do we see that today? I mean, the closest sort of parallel would be, I think, the Uyghur concentration camps that China has in Xinjiang. That is a totalitarian regime. It's a totalitarian regime that has a surveillance architecture that Hitler could only dream about, but that the East Germans came closer to achieving. But, you know, we're not saying by coming here that authoritarianism leads in one step to exactly this again. We're just saying it leads to very bad things. And, for example, what Putin is doing in Ukraine is an example of that. In a weird twist, he said, Ukrainians don't exist, they're really Russians, they're just misinformed about themselves. But then when they didn't play along, he otherized them. And he turned them, he calls them Nazis, ironically. He calls them Satanists. And he's stealing their children. That's an act of genocide. It's part of the definition. Abducting their women and killing their civilians. And so you're only capable of committing such outrages once you've trained you and your followers for a long time to think in us and them as these people have. And we talked a little bit about it when we started the show today, Andreas, about the events of January 6th when we were over at the Reichstag. I wouldn't begin to compare January 6th to either Putin's invasion of Ukraine or the Holocaust. But January 6th is the dangerous outcome of violent rhetoric and a willingness to torch the norms of a civil society and to torch the Constitution. And January 6th is a warning shot, I think, about what can happen if we let our guard down. I think it was a warning shot, and I think what was breached was it marked the transition of subliminal violence that had been in the language of MAGA, of the Proud Boys, for a long time, of subliminal to potential violence, and then took that one step to physical violence. It didn't have to be physical violence on this scale, but once you make that transition, other things become thinkable and other taboos become breakable. And I think that's why it was such an important moment. On that somber and important note, I want to take a break and hear from one of our sponsors. When we come back, uh, we'll walk back over to the Reichstag because you told me there were some reasons you wanted us to end the show there today. Let's do that. Thanks, Andreas. So, Andreas, we've walked around a lot today. We started at the Reichstag. We're now finishing at the Reichstag. That was also your idea. I thought we'd end on a more open-ended route. You thought it'd be useful to come back here and take a second look at this building. Why is that? Because the story here in this place has an open ending, even though the story isn't finished yet. We don't know how the story ends elsewhere. Because what I think the lesson is, is, is that this struggle between democracy and authoritarianism is a tug of war that goes on forever. The uplifting part here is it's very emotional what happened. After reunification, you know, this building had been mothballed during the entire Cold War. A British architect, Sir Norman Foster, came in. They decided to move the capital from Bonn to here. So the workmen got busy and they stripped off the paneling and they found the bullet holes from the end of the war, April 1945. Russian when, bullet holes. Russian bullet holes. They came from the Swiss embassy over there, shot at it from here and from the other side, entered it, and then the Russian soldiers, drunk on vodka, they scrawled their names, graffiti, on these walls. And they found that in the 1990s when they were preparing to renovate it. And a big debate broke out. What should we do? now that we have a united country again and still want to have a better democracy, and they decided to leave the graffiti on the walls. Some of it had to be removed, you know, so that it's G-rated or PG-rated, but make it a feature rather than a bug. But now, 
uh, Olaf Scholz and the members of parliament, when they cast a vote on the Ukraine war, they walk past the graffiti that the Russians scroll there after the defeat of Nazi Germany and the total destruction of their country that time. And that serves what purpose? What's the value in, in having that so front and center? I think it's an exhortation. Like all these monuments here, it's subtle, and not everyone may notice it, but it's saying, be vigilant. Never think the story is over. There is no end of history. The struggle continues. And make sure this democracy doesn't fail a second time. My crash course colleague, Anna Mazarakis, and I were talking as we drove in from the airport into Berlin, how singular it is, I think, that Berliners and, and Germans more broadly have kept these reminders so central to the life of the city. We've looked at a few of them already today, the Reichstag, the bunker, the Holocaust Memorial. But it is essentially an attempt, I think, to use a physical reality, monuments, memorials, and once bombed out buildings as a reminder of the horrors of the past so we don't repeat them in the present. And as Anna and I talked about that, we were remarking how the U.S., for example, we don't really have the same kind of tangible memorials to the genocide involving Native Americans. We don't have the same kind of tangible reminders of slavery. And there's not a lot of other countries that do. And there's something to be said for the fact that the Germans have embraced it to that extent. Explain to me why you think it was so important to Germans to do that. The West German identity during the Cold War was actually built, well, first of all, with the help of the Americans in particular and the Western allies. But then it was built on the foundation of atonement. At some point they realized, we have to examine ourselves and make sure this never happens again. But also we have to take this responsibility and not whitewash anything. And they said, no, we're going to memorialize it and build a new identity on that because the old one is erased. And so it became part of German identity. The East Germans were merged into that identity, not always successfully, but I think the United Nations agreed that we're going to build our iconography around that idea of atonement, of never again, and we're going to get it right this time. So we're standing at a place where democracy in Germany was born, where democracy in Germany was torn out, where democracy was fought over through a, a war, and where democracy was restored. Do you feel optimistic that democracy will remain in place and well protected and well regarded elsewhere in the world? There's a phrase I've heard, paranoid optimism. I think I'm a paranoid optimist, which is good. I believe that in this place, in this country, they're not gonna do it again. You mentioned to me over dinner how ironic it is that the US and NATO that we're trying to get Japan and Germany to rearm well, that's common sense today, because they're not going to be the same threat they were. The threat has moved somewhere else. So it's not about a place going evil. It's more, it could happen again somewhere and in a different way. And so in, in that sense, this building has lessons to teach other countries today, because the struggle and the tug of war is going on in much of the world. And it can disappear when people let their guard down, when people take institutions for granted, and when people don't really respect the rule of law. When taboos are broken and people get bored with that and stop pointing it out, when rules are broken, when the independence of the judiciary is undermined, as in Poland, as in Israel it was attempted but it didn't work. See, that's what should happen. What the Israelis have stopped that move to make their courts dependent on the government. And there's an ongoing battle in the U.S. over this. It sprang fully formed into view after the 2020 election when there was a big battle in the court system and then try to use the law to overturn the results of the 2020 election. American voters, American citizens had to really rely on the judiciary and the wisdom of judges in different states, the sort of sanctity of the judiciary itself and the judicial process to protect democracy and to protect the vote. But in many cases, that, that was on a knife's edge at different times and in different states. That was on a knife's edge. And of course, America, I think the checks and balances are old and mature and robust. But if you look at Hungary, they are no longer there. And the checks and balances include the courts, they include the press, they include other institutions like universities as well. In Hungary, a lot of them have been neutered. 
In other countries, they're gone. Russia, they're gone. And, you know, just Freedom House, the think tank, they've been publishing a report for 50 years on democracy. And they came out with one just a couple of weeks ago. So for the first three decades, they observed that generally the trend was toward more democracy. For 17 years in a row, it's gone the other way. The bright spot there, since I am a paranoid optimist, is that the pace of decline has slowed. But basically, with these same lessons, the Americans have to now relearn them or remember them, and so does everybody else. Well, I'm glad you just raised the issue of a lesson, because I always like to ask guests on the show what lessons they've learned from epic collisions. In this case, we've been talking about the collision between authoritarianism and democracy. You've been an excellent tour guide today. You've educated me and tutored me about various things that we've looked at. Having looked at all of this so long yourself, what is a fresh lesson or what is something that made you say, aha, in this current battle and collision we're having between authoritarianism and democracy? In recent years, I think the two aha moments was not so much January 6th as I was watching it, but when I was watching, as many Germans did, the January 6th committee and Liz Cheney, and to see how close it was and to see it hanging in the balance because it is unresolved. The story is open-ended. We're not in the last chapter. And simultaneously, east of us, what Putin has been doing so long and that the Germans have only woken up to now because they were in la-la land about this, which is the systematic attack against truth. Just to get us to think it doesn't even exist. There's only infinitely many versions of it and you can flip perpetrator and victim. You can flip the role. He can attack Ukraine and says, well, actually, Ukraine and NATO was attacking us. We had to defend ourselves. And then he thinks he can go on to commit genocide and convince his population. That kind of cynicism happened here where we're standing once and must not happen again or must not be allowed to succeed again. So democracy was reborn here at the Reichstag, but Trumpism is alive and well in the United States. And on that note, Andreas, I want to thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Tim. You can um, find Andreas Kluth on Twitter, at Andreas Kluth, and you can find his columns at Bloomberg Opinion. Thanks for joining us today. Here at Crash Course, we believe that collisions can be messy, impressive, challenging, surprising, and always instructive. In today's Crash Course, I learned that while history may not repeat itself, it often rhymes. And while the next dictator may not have a pencil mustache, if he or she comes in the guise of a cartoon, that still doesn't mean they're not dangerous. What did you learn? We'd love to hear from you. You can tweet at the Bloomberg handle, at Opinion, or me, at Tim O'Brien, using the hashtag Bloomberg Crash Course. You can also subscribe to our show wherever you're listening right now and leave us a review. It helps more people find the show. This episode was produced by the indispensable Anna Mazarakis, Moses Andam, and me. Our supervising producer is Magnus Henriksen, and we had editing help from Sage Bauman, Katie Boyce, Jeff Grocott, Mike Nitza, and Christine Vanden Bylard. Blake Maple says our sound engineering, and our original theme song was composed by Luis Guerra. I'm Tim O'Brien. We'll be back next week with another Crash Course. Bis nächstes Mal. What does that mean? See you next time. Uh, my German stops at Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen.